As a leading provider of non-invasive home mechanical ventilation, Medical Service Company's NIV program is dedicated to enhancing patient outcomes, lowering healthcare costs, and minimizing hospitalizations. Our program seamlessly integrates expert respiratory therapists with state-of-the-art home ventilator technology, aiming to deliver optimal results and significantly improve patient quality of life. When a new home ventilator request is received, our clinical team collaborates closely with the prescribing physician to assure that the medical records meet all insurance requirements. This collaboration helps guarantee that patients receive the essential equipment and care they need. Engagement between patients and clinicians is crucial for successful therapy. To support this, our respiratory specialists commit to at least five hours of direct interaction with new NIV patients within the first 30 days of starting therapy. In addition, we offer quarterly home visits and monthly phone check-ins to ensure consistent, ongoing communication. For more information about our NIV program, please contact your local MSC Territory Manager or visit our website at www.medicalserviceco.com. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed today's educational forum. With that being said, this brings us to our final speaker for this afternoon's respiratory track. Mike Hess will be presenting a series of unfortunate events, oxygen therapy in the U.S. Mike graduated from Western Michigan University with a Bachelor of Science in Interdisciplinary Health Services and a Master's Degree in Public Health. He began his career as a registered respiratory therapist at Bronson Methodist Hospital and continued on to work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. He then transitioned to Western Michigan University Homer Stryker School of Medicine as their chronic lung disease coordinator and worked as a consultant to write a continuing education course on mechanical ventilation for the American Association of Respiratory Care. He has authored numerous publications and has many ongoing projects which he's involved in, including a podcast entitled The COPD Podcast for the COPD Foundation. Mike currently serves as a Senior Director of Patient Outreach and Education for the COPD Foundation. As you listen to the final lecture, you can submit your questions for Mike under the Engage tab. To receive credit for attending, please complete and submit the evaluation at the conclusion of this session. Enjoy the presentation. Welcome everybody and thank you for coming to this webinar today, a series of unfortunate events, how oxygen therapy ran out of gas in America. We're going to be talking about the critical issues facing uh, supplemental oxygen infrastructure here in the United States uh, and what we can hopefully do to fix that. Uh, my name is Mike Hess. I am a respiratory therapist and senior director of advocacy and regulatory affairs for the COPD Foundation. And I lead our oxygen advocacy initiatives as, long, as well as education and, and innovation, and basically all things oxygen at the foundation. So really excited to share this, uh, this opportunity today. Uh, we're going to be talking about, or excuse me, first off, we'll lead off with my disclaimers because those are important. Um, no direct conflicts of interest. Um, however, it should be noted that my employer does receive uh, consultant fees from some companies within the oxygen industry uh, really shouldn't have any impact on the the, uh, um, the the content today. There is nobody who had any other input in it. Um, I just want to put that out there just uh, for the sake of being thorough. So what exactly are we going to be talking about today? Well, first, we're going to review the history of supplemental oxygen therapy uh, and, of course, its reimbursement here in the United States. We're going to identify some common knowledge gaps for both patients and healthcare professionals because, again, those lead to some serious issues with how we deliver care. And we're going to look at some of the issues surrounding uh, over-the-counter non-prescription oxygen uh, equipment uh, supplies and devices. So uh, first off, where are we exactly? You know, hopefully many of you out there watching this right now have heard over the last year or so this push for this thing called the SOAR Act, the Supplemental Ox Oxygen Access Reform Act. You've heard about it from AARC, certainly, maybe ALA, maybe the COPD Foundation. Um, you know, but th the question is, what's so wrong with oxygen therapy? How did we get to where we are and why do we need to fix it? 
Well, my dad was a history teacher and he always taught me in order to figure out where you are and where you need to go, you have to kind of look back to where you came from. So just briefly, we're going to touch on uh, what's actually kind of a fascinating history of oxygen therapy. Um, we've known about the, the concept of oxygen all the way back to, to 1771, a gentleman by the name of Carl Wilhelm Scheele, uh, I might be mispronouncing that, and if so, I apologize, discovers what he called fire air. Uh, he did a couple of different compounds, uh, silver carbonate, magnesium nitrate, some other things, um, and, and discovered that, that was his process to actually discovering oxygen. Unfortunately, Joseph Priestley usually gets the credit because as Isaac Asimov, the American science fiction writer, uh, um, described it, this, uh, this Carl Scheel uh, usually was called hard luck Scheel because he was the first to discover about a half dozen different elements, but he wasn't the first to publish about it. And of course, you know, the first person to publish usually gets the biggest credit. And so in this particular case, um, he didn't, he actually documented his findings in 1775, um, but didn't publish them until 1777, at which point Priestley had, had stepped in uh, with his discovery of what he called deflogisticated air, which um, it, the current prevailing theory of the time uh, of combustion was that anything that burned had this material called phlogiston in it that was released upon burning. And that's what actually made it combust. Um, oxygen in and of itself is not flammable, does not burn. It's an accelerant, but it doesn't burn itself. Um, so it was thought to have none of this phlogiston. And so that then it supported combustion with everything else. Um, and that's, that's how he got all the credit for it. Now, he unfortunately also had some hard luck uh, on his own because uh, at the time he had some political and theological positions that were a little bit controversial. Um, controversial enough that actually an angry mob burned down his house and he had to move back to England, or excuse me, move from England uh, to Pennsylvania. And so he, that's when he, he came to America. Uh, and then not long after that, Antoine Lavoisier posited that um, oxygen was actually an element instead of a, a substance or a compound or anything like that, and was the first person to really consider that what we now know as the respiration process was actually a slow form of oxidation or rust or you know cellular decay, that sort of thing. And uh, trip, uh, topping off our, our trio of hard luck folks, uh, 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 Professor Lavoisier, Lavoisier here was a victim of the guillotine during the French Revolution uh, because he was connected to the royal family. Um, they funded his lab. So uh, unfortunately, the, the problems with oxygen actually are, are kind of part and parcel to the whole deal as it turns out. Uh, moving into the, the 20th century, things get a little bit better, actually. Uh, 1907, uh, this gentleman named Arbuthnot Lane invented the nasal oxygen catheter. Um, a little bit different than the cannulas we use today, but again, was delivering supplemental, a method of delivering supplemental oxygen um, through the nose, which, you know, of course, is what we, what we go on to use today. And then 1922, we really start getting into this whole idea of medical oxygen, where Alvin Barrick uh, published the use, on the use of oxygen therapy uh, for folks with pneumonia and helped them survive uh, in the hospital setting. And then re things really start going uh, in 1956 when uh, Dr. Thomas Petty and his team published on the use of oxygen therapy uh, for relief of symptoms in chronic airways obstruction. Now we start kind of getting back into a little bit of the hard luck because, as, as many of you may know, uh, Dr. Petty actually went on to require supplemental oxygen later in life uh, due to some cardiac issues. And he published a couple of books called Adventures of an Oxyphile, uh, really a fascinating study on, on the both sides of the stethoscope here. Um, and then we started putting some science behind it uh, in 1980. In 1981, we had two uh, kind of parallel studies, one in the U.S., the NOT trial, and one in the U.K., the Medical Research Council, that really started to show a mortality benefit for folks with supplemental oxygen. Um, and, you know, again, these were relatively small research cohorts. So you, if, if you look at how we do research, if you can see a huge effect in a small amount of people, um, you know, again, controlling for all the variables and things like that, then it's pretty clear that this is going to be uh, have a positive influence on somebody's uh, disease course. And again, these are the things that continue to underlie our research um, even today. We know that uh, if you are chronically hypoxemic, if you use it for at least 15 hours a day, you do have a survival benefit. And it's actually one of the few therapies, at least in COPD, where we've been able to demonstrate that.
So, you know, we look back from 1956 to 1981, um, and we're looking at, you know, we've gone from this theory uh, or uh, the, the conventional usage of the word theory, where we have these ideas and things like that. And now we've got science behind it. We've got evidence. We've got evidence-based practice. Surely the 40 years that followed after 1981, we'd see the same kind of progress, right? Well, it turns out, unfortunately, we're back to the bad news. Um, in a study that came out um, just before the pandemic uh, from the American Thoracic Society, um, a study of several thousand uh, oxygen therapy users found that supplemental oxygen users reported experiencing frequent and varied problems with their therapy. Again, this is looking at the long-term, you know, the, the ambulatory care setting. So what were some of these problems? What are the issues that these frequent and, and varied problems people are facing? Well, first of all, it's reliability. You know, half of the people who were on supplemental oxygen, again, this thing that is literally keeping people alive for longer, had at least one issue related to their equipment. A little over half said that their equipment wasn't working. Um, almost a third said that they had difficulty arranging travel oxygen. Um, a fifth, 20%, said that they could not change providers. Um, and we'll get into some of the reasons behind that as we go on here. And another almost 20% reported that their provider does not respond to calls, which is a real issue. Um, and now we can chalk that up to bad customer service. We, we can chalk it up to a lot of different things, uh, but it is a little bit more complicated than that. I don't say these things to throw our partners in the DME space under the bus or anything like that. Again, as we'll see as we go on here, but these are very real issues facing real people. In addition to that, people are really stuck in their homes. You know, we're, we as clinicians tell people, get out there, stay active, stay engaged. And then we essentially give people a boat anchor that ties them in place. Um, you know, the vast majority of people, 81%, said that their portable oxygen lasted less than four hours. And, you know, maybe if you're, if you're just looking at it generally, maybe four hours seems like a good amount of time. But if you think about all the people who have, for example, COPD, and all the other comorbidities that go along with that and the other issues that they have to face and everything else. Now you start looking at, well, how many hours a day do I spend outside with doctor's appointments? I have to arrange transportation. So, you know, I try and consolidate these things all in the same day. Or, you know, there are a lot of people who are still in the workforce. Um, a good friend of mine uh, with pulmonary hypertension, um, excuse me, she has bronchiectasis due to uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia, um, told the story about how when she first went on supplemental oxygen, she was actually still in the workforce and told the delivery driver that, well, this isn't enough tanks to get me through the day because uh, I need to go to work. And the driver told her, well, what are you talking about? People with oxygen don't work. You don't, you don't go anywhere. You're just here at home. You don't need a lot of tanks. So that, those are some of the issues that these folks are facing. And of course, that leads to 44% uh, saying that because of these issues with supplemental oxygen equipment, they can't leave the house. Their extra domiciliary activity is limited um, frequently. And another 35% said that they were limited at least sometimes. So that is, again, a vast majority, four-fifths, 80%, well, 79%, I suppose, felt limited by their equipment. And again, that is directly opposite from what we're trying to tell people and indeed why we give them supplemental oxygen in the first place. And perhaps even more concerningly, 20% uh, felt that these systems could not provide them adequate oxygenation. Um, they weren't staying saturated with these things. They, they just weren't, it wasn't able to keep up with them. So not only do they have a solution that really isn't one and limits their activity outside the house, even when they're outside, they're still not getting their full benefit from it. And part of that may be because they're not necessarily trained how to use it properly. Um, 64% of people were trained by their delivery driver, again, on that initial setup. Um, now, again, not trying to throw anybody under the bus. I absolutely love all of my delivery drivers. You know, they, I see them probably far more than I should, certainly far more than my credit card would like. Um, but this is not necessarily the person that you want to be teaching you how to use your life staining equipment. It's an unfair expectation on them. It's an unfair expectation on you. Uh, especially when you have to go back and report to your clinician, well, I'm using it or I'm not using it, so on and so forth. Um, and the, these next two points may seem like they're a little bit out of order, um, but 10% of these folks were instructed by literally no one. 
and only 8% were instructed by a clinician. So we actually had more people who were instructed by no one and who were uh, getting perhaps what I call the, the stop, drop, and roll, where the driver stops at their front door, drops off the equipment, and rolls along to the next delivery, than were actually getting taught how and why to use their oxygen therapy by a trained clinician. Now, imagine that. Imagine putting somebody on um, diabetes medication or, and asking them to check their blood sugars. Or you think about what we do in the acute care setting. You know, we're, we're trying to get people to do these complex therapies and then not actually teaching them how to do it. And so, of course, that leads to over a third saying that I don't know what they're doing. They're unprepared to operate their equipment. And again, that is entirely fair, but they have to then turn around and talk to their clinician and say, well, this oxygen really isn't helping me any. And when the clinician asks them, well, are you using it right? Uh, they don't know. They may think they are. You know, it's a lot like we see in, in inhaled medications. They may think that they're using it perfectly fine, and they're actually not because they've never received adequate instructions. And unfortunately, the issue is not much better on the clinical side of things. Um, this is from a, a different study that came out as part of the, the uh, ATS clinical practice guidelines, where they actually uh, asked physicians to self-report how they the issues that they saw in, in oxygen therapy. And for example, the first one there, non-existent prescription writing guidelines. There was really no consistent way for folks to write oxygen, prescriptions for oxygen. There are the requirements for Medicare. There, you know, there are guidelines and things like that, but there's not really an, a, a, a consistent way to help clinicians give somebody the right dose at the right time with the right equipment. Uh, we see uh, what they describe as unsafe and problematic device marketing. You know, a lot of some of these devices are marketed direct to consumer and may provide, shall we say, an unrealistic expectation in a lot of folks about how their equipment is going to make sure that they're ensure that they're getting out and doing the things we're asking them to do. Um, and again, that causes some frustration. They're not able to uh, coordinate very well with the DME suppliers. And again, this comes kind of back to staffing issues and things like that, that get into reimbursement uh, that we're going to touch on later on, but it is really complicated. And before I joined the foundation, I actually worked in a primary care office. I was a, had an unusual position, you know, being kind of a care coordinator and patient educator in a primary care space. And I saw firsthand how complicated it is going from one company to another. And even, you know, sometimes if you have staff turnover, how really inconsistent it can be to work with some of these companies. And of course, we don't have a lot of very good outcomes measurements because, uh, and again, this is maybe a regulatory issue, but we look at very objective outcomes uh, in a lot of medicine, reducing exacerbations, uh, longevity, mortality, that sort of thing. And oxygen therapy is good at some of that, but it probably doesn't tell the whole picture. So if somebody is, is asking, is this helping me? We don't really have, again, good guidelines uh, on what to tell them. And again, I want to point out, this is all before the pandemic. This was, uh, this these documents came out in 2017, 2018. That was when things were good. Um, you know, the pandemic, of course, cratered a lot of these things and exacerbated a, a whole lot more. So um, you can kind of see the, the eight ball we're behind these days. So how did we let it get so bad? How did we get to this point? Uh, and this is where the whole idea of a series of unfortunate events kind of comes in because a lot of these things were likely well-meaning, but they have kind of snowballed to the point where we really have major, major structural issues that were as kind of like the death of a thousand paper cuts. Uh, it was a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and now we're really facing disaster. So we're going to look at another timeline again. Um, this one is a little bit less um, um, dramatic, perhaps. There's no beheadings. There's no burning down a house or anything like that. Um, but we go back to 1965 when Medicare was first established, and it did include a benefit for home oxygen. You know, Again, this was still kind of early days in the process, but they knew that this was a therapy that could help people. And so they said, yeah, let's throw that in there. Um, the predominant more, uh, uh, modality was compressed gas tanks. Um, which they would ship out to the house. And it was pretty easy to, to kind of track um, how much somebody was using because, you know, if you gave them a, you know, 200 PSI tank and they used it all, then you had, a, you know, you could do the formulas and figure out exactly how much oxygen they were using. And so much like we would pay, you know, you pay your water bill or what have you, you paid by consumption. 
you're reimbursed by consumption. Then in the 70s and, and 80s, uh, the idea of this oxygen concentrator started coming into prevalence. Um, very similar, um, almost identical in many aspects to the devices we see today. You use a molecular sieve to filter out the nitrogen and send uh, the remaining oxygen and trace gases into a compressor, thereby delivering almost pure oxygen through a nasal cannula um, to, the, to the patient. These were great from a DME perspective because you didn't have to always ship out a lot of folks or a lot of um, deliveries to a person's house because you went once, um, you gave them the concentrator, maybe some backup tanks, maybe if they were ambulatory, because this was, again, early days when people didn't necessarily live super long on oxygen therapy, and they were rather sick. Um, you know, you give them the portable systems and the backups and things like that, but it really reduced a lot of the labor costs. And again, you could essentially figure out how much oxygen somebody was using by multiplying the liters delivered per minute by the number of hours that um, uh, the, the, the concentrator was in use. So we really started, you know, it was still this kind of consumption-based model. And there got to be this idea of, well, wait a minute here, we're still paying it like we used to when it was strictly consumption and they had to send people out all the time. Um, but you're maybe not doing as much labor. And so maybe your costs are, are not as, as big. And uh, maybe you're making a little bit more money than you should and, and that you've been leading on to. And so we're going to take a look at that. Um, and so then in 1987, in an effort to kind of start regulating the, the reimbursement for oxygen therapy, we had this thing called the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act which establish what they call modality neutral uh, fee schedules, where no matter what device or what way you delivered it, whether it was compressed gas or concentrator or whatever, you were basically going to get the same fee per month. This was uh, not just an oxygen. There were several other pieces of durable medical equipment that, that came onto this, having a, a, a what they call a fee schedule where um, the government says, well, if you give somebody a walker or a wheelchair or a hospital bed, this is what we're going to pay you instead of it being based on a percentage of the, the costs that were incurred. And this was really where the first crack started to show up because obviously oxygen is a little bit more complicated and therefore more expensive than a walker or a wheelchair or a hospital bed. And this is where some of the first red flags kind of started popping up. But it wasn't quite enough for the, the folks who were looking at the Medicare bottom line, things like that. Because again, there really wasn't, there was a big disconnect, I'll say, between the clinical world and the administrative world. They didn't, you don't really understand much as it is probably today, the intricacies of how we deliver care. And it's not just a, a set fee amount. So another decade later, we had this uh, another law called the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, which again reduced the uh, re uh, the reimbursement fee for oxygen equipment by 30% over the course of 12 months. And even worse than that, arguably, it also froze any kind of um, um, inflation-based adjustments based on the consumer price index for a decade. So basically, these prices were going to be locked in for 10 years, regardless of what happened to the economy, whatever, regardless of what happened with costs and things like that. Um, and that was really where things started to squeeze. And this is where we first started to see things like liquid oxygen, which used to be very prevalent, um, start to come off the market because those modalities are more expensive than um, a, a gas, you know, a, a tank or a cylinder. And we started this kind of race to the bottom of how are we going to do this stuff cheaply instead of most effectively. There was a little bit of a bright spot here in the early 2000s when the portable oxygen concentrator was developed, essentially a miniaturized version of what you might see in somebody's house, uh, operated by batteries. Some trade-offs here, you know, the, the sieve beds are smaller and so they can't filter out as much and the delivery is a little different and things like that. But again, we thought, well, maybe this is a thing where the, this is, will allow somebody to leave the house uh, more readily um, and have that portable oxygen without depleting their tanks and having to resupply them and all that sort of thing. But again, we start getting into this era of confusion where there's some inconsistencies and they, we'll touch on some of those in a minute too. And every potential solution also introduces another set of problems. And then we start getting into what what people are most familiar with, with really chopping the legs out from the, the DME industry, uh, what we call the competitive bidding program. Uh, this was another reform effort uh, that was uh, it started in 2003, um, where again, in their infinite wisdom, uh, the, the folks running the show said, hey, 
Um, if company A can do it for this amount of dollars, why shouldn't company B be able to do it for that amount of dollars? And so essentially what they did was they established these bidding areas, regions throughout the country, and said, okay, um, give us your best shot. You know, Tell us what it's going to cost to deliver and service this oxygen equipment. And then um, the lowest bid is going to be the prevailing reimbursement for everybody in that region because everybody should be able to do it in the same way. And that's really where things started to really take a turn for the worse. The program was quite flawed to begin with, and I could do a whole other talk about, you know, it, it, it was passed and then it stopped immediately and it was vetoed and then it was overridden and then it was stopped and then it was rebids and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but suffice it to say, it was flawed to begin with. Um, rental payments were capped at 36 months. Um, so even if somebody lived longer than that, you weren't going to get a lot more reimbursement from that. <clears throat> excuse me, um, which again is another, essentially another reduction in reimbursement. Um, and we'll talk about that now, as a matter of fact, Medicare actually rents oxygen equipment because it's called a, considered a capital item, capital purchase on a month to month basis. And what they do is they will pay for a stationary device and they will pay for a portable device. Again, it doesn't matter if it's a concentrator, a portable concentrator, um, liquid, uh, tanks, whatever it is, it's up to that DME supplier to determine what is best for the patient. Um, usually it ends up being the most cost-effective solution, not necessarily the best one, because again, these are companies that are trying to stay alive so that they can service some people with some equipment instead of servicing nobody. Um, rental payments are provided to oxygen suppliers, as I mentioned, for 36 months. But, and here's the real kicker, you still have to service those folks and provide their disposables and things like that for an additional 24 months. You get locked into this five-year contract that you're only getting paid really for three of it. There is a nominal fee for some of the portable things and again, some of the equipment, things like that. But this is what makes it so hard to for somebody to switch service providers, particularly if they're anywhere close to that two-year window, because it's not tied to the supplier, it's tied to the patient. So if you are dissatisfied with your company or th some, something like that, or they, they decide they're not going to service you in the way that you would like uh, your equipment to be, you're usually out of luck because you're not getting any money from them anyway, You're not, or they're not getting any money from you. A new company isn't going to get any money from you, and they're going to be very reluctant to expend that because again, these are businesses at the end of the day. So again, had a lot of issues with implementation. Uh, it took a couple of years to even get the thing off the ground after they tried to do the rebid process a couple, a couple different times. Um, eventually it was declared a success, uh, taking effect in nine markets after some additional rebid, rebids and revisions and things like that. And then it was, again, a success. So they expanded it out to 100 markets, which comprised about 80%, I think, um, of, of the Medicare beneficiary market. Um, and then in um, not long after that, rates were frozen at, in, at the level they were in 2015. Um, and then in 2020, the um, uh, competitive bidding process was actually paused because of the um, you know, right. It was proximal to the pandemic. It was largely because they said, well, let's take a look at this again. We'll put a pause on there. Um, there was some of that uh, going on anyway. And then they decided, well, the pandemic is here. Uh, so let's just put a, put a stop to everything. We're going to, we'll give everybody inflation related adjustments, which uh, came up to about 8% uh, over the course of, uh, from um, 2013, 2015 to even into 2022. And I probably don't need to tell anybody the cost of living and the cost of doing business has increased significantly more than 8% uh, during that time. So it's really been a squeeze on a lot of these DME providers to the point where, you know, again, this, this is looking at um, um, where I'm coming from in Michigan here. There's actually a survey that comes out every few years by a company called VGM that looks ex exactly at how much uh, equipment costs to deliver and service. Um, and so in our region here, the delivery cost is about $105 uh, just to send somebody out on a trip um, to cover the, the vehicle costs and mileage and you know, labor costs and things like that. In Michigan right now, under current Medicare reimbursement schedules, depending on where you are in the state, you get $84 to $109 per, 
per person per month per deliver, you know, to, to deliver this. So at best, you're maybe making five bucks a person on this. And again, trying to cover the costs of running your business um, and everything else. And also important to remember that 20% of this cost is still borne by the patient. Um, and that also leads to, well, now the ME companies have to go to collections and you know, they're, they're responsible for collecting that, that copay and things like that. Again, it's just this massive cost drain, and that has led to reduction in service, reduction in staff. That's why we don't have clinicians going out anymore. That's why we have drivers who are in a big hurry to get back on the road and, and not do a lot of uh, even teaching to to what they're comfortable with. Um, we, they simply do not have the infrastructure to support that anymore. Um, to the point where um, uh, the American Association for Home Care actually came out and said, Today's payment rates were created under a flawed bidding program that is not sustainable. And, you know, again, this is their industry group and they probably have a little bit of a, um, a particular bias. But to me, that seems entirely fair. I mean, I can't imagine trying to run a business on, on $5 a person. That just doesn't make sense, especially considering all the other things that you have to service out there. So unfortunately, we have seen that uh, there has been a lot of consolidation and reduction in the DME space. Um, since the just the dawn of competi competitive bidding, we've seen 73% uh, fewer uh, oxygen suppliers, uh, liquid oxygen suppliers, excuse me, um, and about 90% of oxygen uh, liquid oxygen claims have gone away. Um, about 40% of portable oxygen suppliers have also vanished. Now, some of this, again, is people going out of business. Some of it is consolidation. Um, but the upshot is there are fewer choices for people in the marketplace right now. There has been significant consolidation, and there's just not any way around that. It limits choice. It limits people's options if they're just not... If, they're, if they happen to have one of those companies that you'll recall 20% said that my company never returns my phone calls or things like that, um, they don't have a choice. There's nowhere else to go. And we actually heard stories about that at the foundation back in the, the initial Texas ice storms, which I think were in 22-ish, 21, 22, uh, that first round of really unseasonable ice storms in Texas. Um, we had people in in Dallas that were saying, hey, my DME supplier said that I need to call their their regional office in Kansas City or Oklahoma City. They won't they can't they can't get hold of me. Our local shop closed up and left. That's reality for a lot of these folks. And, you know, again, we'll go back to already feeling at least somewhat unprepared to operate their equipment because they're not even getting this instruction. Now, I imagine like many um uh, well, uh, I, I shouldn't say I imagine. Like many, when I first got into the ambulatory care space, I didn't really think a lot about how oxygen was delivered in this. I was used to, well, you plug the flow meter in the wall, you turn it on, you get what you want. And it's really a lot different, you know, even even con stationary concentrators, but particularly if we look at um, portable devices, portable concentrators and portable tanks alike often deliver oxygen, what's called pulse dosing, where instead of a continuous flow of gas, they actually have a little sensor in there that detects when somebody is inhaling and delivers a little bolus of oxygen at that time. For a compressed gas tank, that helps them helps the, the tank last longer. But for a portable concentrator, it actually is necessary because it cannot concentrate the same amount of oxygen that a stationary device does. So it simply does not have enough to deliver. And it has to be more, you have to be more mindful of when that dose is getting delivered. Instead of having it be wasted on exhalation or things like that, it's only delivered uh, when it's supposedly doing the most good. Now, again, there's some physiological aspects where we would want somebody to still be on continuous flow, but be that as it may, we need to remember that these are not the same. Oftentimes, we will see somebody say, a clinician, or, you know, a, a pulmonologist, even an RT, will say, well, two liters a minute is the same as your setting of two on, on your, your portable concentrator. And it's really not. Um, this is a, a capture from or, uh, um, yeah, a capture from the uh, um, uh, portable oxygen concentrators guide from that AARC put out getting a little long in the tooth about a decade ago from several different um, devices out there. And we can see each of these settings, a one, two, three, four, five at the top there, they each have a slightly different um, uh, 
bolus size, either delivering a slightly different amount of gas. I probably should have done a better job of putting a label on there. Math teachers would be mad at me about making a graph with no label on there, not labeling the axes. But um, that top row there, that is how much oxygen you're getting when you inhale. And um, you can see it's different from, from all of these devices. And unfortunately, we even see a lot of the marketing out there saying that, yeah, they are the same. This is, a, you know, I'm not going to throw a brand under the bus, but this is um, marketing materials from a website from one of the portable device manufacturers that says this will deliver up to six liters a minute. No, it will deliver a setting of six, but even the top of the line concentrators on the market right now, the absolute maximum that any portable concentrator can deliver right now is three liters a minute. And those are the ones that are like the carry-on suitcase thing that you lug behind you and all that sort of thing. The ones that you put in a shoulder bag and everybody's happy and you know having um, summer at the beach and all that sort of thing. You're lucky if you're getting one and a half to two out of that. And if though at those maximum settings, your battery life is also going to be in the toilet. So we really need to do a better job at informing ourselves and therefore our patients that these are not the same and people may have to change them based on their clinical needs. Unfortunately, this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to bad information out there. We've also seen a rise over the last couple of years of what we've called, we've started to call noncentrators uh, at the foundation. These are actually portable oxygen devices marketed as portable oxygen concentrators that you can go on Amazon, you can go on Facebook Marketplace, you can go on a lot of these places and see see them for sale. You don't need a prescription. They're saying things like, oh yeah, we can give you nine liters a minute at 93%, you know, that high concentration there. Um, you know, they have a lot of clip art on there that looks fantastic, uh, looks very professional. Everybody's looking happy, the clinical people on there with stethoscopes and clipboards and everything else talking about how great this device is. Unfortunately, we um, found out that the reality is a little bit different. Um, we worked with uh, Dr. Rich Casaburi and his team out at uh, UCLA Medical Center um, uh, and published this uh, last year in 2023, where we actually bought three of these devices from Amazon and put them on the, the metabolic simulator that they have at UCLA and put them head to head with, um, with a uh, FDA authorized concentrator, uh, both on continuous flow and pulse dose and with a compressed gas uh, tank. And, you know, this is a, a complicated slide, and I invite you to go read it. It's in our journal, Respiratory Care. I invite you to go uh, track this down and, and read it for yourself. But the moral of the story here is you can see that a couple of these devices just aren't doing anything. Um, the the, the, um, um, the, the noncentrators are all represented on the bottom row there, and you can kind of see D kind of flattens out a little bit, doesn't really do much depending on whatever setting you're on. Um, e was only able to uh, um, give us one delivery setting. Uh, F kind of did the job, but still inferior to the, the approved device. Um, also, D had no battery, even though it was marketed as a portable device and it weighed 13 pounds. Um, it was portable in the sense that you could pick it up and physically relocate it somewhere else, but it's not like you could go out and go to your doctor's office with it or anything like that. Uh, e again had that single flow rate, and no matter what setting it was on. It was hard to tell whether it was a malfunction or was just designed that way and that was too bad for you. There was no way to tell. Um, and then F again was reasonable, had the pulse still settings. It was only about six and a half pounds. So it was kind of in that ballpark, but still two out of the three were no good, essentially. Not suitable for use by pulmonary patients to facilitate ambulation by providing a clinically relevant increase in, in oxygen. And again, th this is on a bench. This is, this is empirical data that, that we found here. Um, had no battery, you know, all these sorts of things. The all the all the really interesting thing was that all of these devices then promptly also disappeared from our order history of immediately upon shipping. Um, so there was no customer support. They would just disappear. You you they shipped. You would go into your Amazon order history, and it just said item not found. They just poof vanished um, because that's how these companies operate. They're essentially fake companies. Uh, another story that I found um, after this study, um, actually discovered earlier this year, um, a friend pointed, pointed out uh, an ad on Facebook Marketplace 
this company uh, literally had a thing that was maybe the size of, of two uh, um, soda pop cans, um, had three buttons and was supposed to, you know, had all the same clams that can deliver five liters a minute, and, um, blah, 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 blah. And so I had a little, first off, I had a little fun with their, with their, with them in the chat and the Facebook posts. It's like, well, how often do you have to replace the sit beds? What alarms are on here? Why is it pulse dose? What's the bolus size? All that sort of thing. Then I dug a little deeper and looked at their website and I, they had pictures of three of their, their, um, they had their customer experience manager and their CEO and, uh, somebody else in, in customer service, uh, very professional looking and all that. And then I had the idea to do a reverse image search. And actually found all three pictures on stock photo sites. One of them was a man smiling at Christmas time. One was man smiling, leaning against the post. Um, they just created these fake websites to ship out these pieces of junk, literally, um, and take advantage of people because people unfortunately don't know better because again, we have not done a very good job as a, as a society, as a healthcare system, whatever you want to put it at teaching people about oxygen therapy. So outside of that, we also have limited information with science. Again, this is another issue that we're facing. Those original studies, you'll recall, 1980, 1981, 40 years old now. We've seen a lot of inconsistency since then because these studies are hard to do. One of the biggest ones, you know, it had trouble recruiting over, over the better part of a decade and therefore gives us inconsistent results, especially with the outcomes that were given, um, mortality and, and exacerbations. We've looked at, you know, what do we do with people who are less hypoxemic? You know, they don't hit that, that 88% that we usually prescribe for. What if they're only hypoxemic on exertion? Um, you know, we, we found, you know, up to three years, no improvement on these things. Adherence was low. Um, you know, this was, uh, um, this was back in 1997. So it's an older study. Um, but, you know, again, we're looking at now we know, well, 15 hours really does seem to be the, the issue or the, the cutoff to get better uh, mortality benefit and things like that. Um, you know, in 2010, we, we followed 200, or we didn't, but this group followed uh, 239 patients for a week. Some, some reported some uh, subjective improvement. Is it the oxygen? Is it the flow? It's really hard to say. It's again a week um, because that's what we can, those are the trials that we can do right now. Uh, perhaps the most famous one, and this is the one that, that had trouble recruiting uh, for up to six years, only managed to pull in 738 patients. Uh, there was no improvement on time to death, first hospitalization, quality of life, activity tolerance. Um, but again, this was really difficult to, to perform. They had recruitment issues. Um, they define this as, as a desaturation under 90% for at least 10 seconds, um, had to be redesigned halfway through. It, these are just really hard to recruit for. They're really hard to retain. They're really hard to, to operationalize because they're expensive and they're longitudinal and takes, I mean, even if we did one of these studies right now, we wouldn't know the results for another 10 years, which is another decade of lost clinical practice. And on top of that, <laughs> Do we even know what we're measuring? What we describe as hypoxemia is probably inefficient. One of the most common ways we test people to see if they need oxygen therapy is the six minute walk test, which is not what that test is meant for. It is supposed to be a measure of pulmonary re or of activity tolerance, usually as an outcome measurement for pulmonary rehab. But still, because there's been that confusion on the clinical side, we'll have somebody walk in a flat clinic space for six minutes, no more, no less, and if they don't desaturate, then they don't need oxygen. But then what happens when they go home and they're pulling laundry up and down the stairs or they're trying to garden or they're taking a shower, you know, they're doing all this other exertion that isn't represented by that. They don't, they, and then we tell them they don't need oxygen and they clearly do. Then they start thinking, well, is there something more wrong with me? Or does my doctor know what they're doing? You know, well, what's going on? So we need to look at other things. Maybe it's DLCO. Uh, there was one study that, that um, um, you know, I, I listed here. It's a good predictor of probability of desaturation and magnitude of desaturation. Should we be looking at, at you know, bringing in pulmonary function testing with that? Are there other things we can look at? Is it desaturation and pulse rate or respiratory rate? Is there some kind of index we can create? Hard to say. We need to look at that. 
of course, we've all heard the stories over the last couple of years about how um, there does seem to be important clini or clinically important bias in pulse oximetry with patients with darkly pigmented skin, especially when they get into those critical ranges. It consistently impacts readings. It's great. It's, you know, it helps us not have to draw blood all the time and everything else. But we see whether it's in the ICU or even in general clinical practice, there are significant issues with it. And so, again, we're looking at entire populations that might, might have this silent hypoxemia that are going untreated. So not only is it a clinical issue, it's a health equity issue. It's, it's a, a population health issue because we're not we don't know that we have the right tools. And even when we have them, we're not necessarily applying them properly. Even under ideal conditions, oximeters have a margin of error between two and 4%. You know, the better the oximeter, the, the generally speaking, the lower uh, the margin of error. But let's say you've got somebody at 89%. Technically, they don't qualify for oxygen, but they might actually be 87% or 85%, and they might actually need it but again, because of the measurement tools we have, they've got other stuff going on. Maybe they aren't really hitting those, those trigger points. So again, we need to look at some of the context behind these things. We need to understand that the tools that we have are great, but they are flawed. And we do need to, as, as one of the first things I was taught in respiratory school, we've got to treat the patient and not the number. And hopefully we can also get our um, um, policy and regulatory environment to start reflecting that. So how do we do that? Well, there are some things that we can look at. You know, I, I kind of tossed the SOAR out, Act out there at the beginning of this. Again, hopefully you're somewhat familiar with this, but there are several pillars to reforming oxygen therapy. First of all, we must make it patient-centric. You know, we talk a lot in healthcare about precision medicine, personalized medicine, all that sort of thing. And then we try to do a cookie cutter solution with something like oxygen therapy. We give everybody the same device, the same kind of flow, everything like that. We need to start looking at it as the right tool for the right job with the right person. And we also need to make sure that education is a key part of this. People, you, you can't use a tool if you don't know how. Um, you know, I, I talk about that with, with inhalers sometimes. You know, it's like trying to uh, drive in a screw with a hammer. It might work eventually, but you're going to make a huge mess in the meantime. And it's certainly not the best way to go about it. And you're just going to get stressed out. And we also need to make sure we're streamlining oxygen therapy and we don't have clinicians doing five layers of paperwork trying to go back and forth with their DME because both sides are, are, are have time pressures, both sides have staffing issues. We've got to make it easy enough to order consistently, but also resistant to fraud, waste, and abuse, which is which kind of led us on this pale or this trail to begin with, or at least the perception of that. So of course, a key part of that is the SOAR Act, which embodies all of those pillars. Um, so there's a QR code on the screen right now. You can go to this link. This goes to the AARC Action Center. Um, I know Congress is, is Congress. Um, and you know we're, we're by the time you're watching this, we're in the lame duck session right now. We're hoping to get this added to some must-pass legislation at the end of the year. Uh, but please contact your two senators and your representative get them to sign on to this and get this uh, get us on the path to doing things a little bit better. We also need to promote additional research and, and uh, development of guidelines. I'm fortunate enough to be working on an AARC clinical practice guideline for transitioning people from the hospital where most people get initially diagnosed to the home with oxygen therapy. There are the, uh, the ATS clinical practice guidelines that came out uh, in 2020, uh, which are very helpful. Let's make sure that we're sticking with those. And again, doing that research for finding our better tools for uh, diagnosing, monitoring, and evaluating and delivering oxygen therapy. Uh, and finally, Awareness is absolutely essential. Uh, we're really trying hard to put a face on oxygen therapy. Um, we've just started a new video series where we talk about the face of oxygen therapy isn't always what you'd expect. It's not always the cranky 70 year old down the street that smoked eight packs a day for most of their life um, that you might see on TV. It's younger people with pulmonary hypertension. It's people with congenital birth uh, anomalies in their heart and lungs. It's pulmonary fibrosis. It's all of these things that are outside of, well, you're on oxygen because you smoked. And we need to reduce those stereotypes because that also reduces the stigma. 
one of the, the the goals or perhaps the dreams, hopefully not, but the goals is to make an oxygen cannula not look all that much different than a pair of eyeglasses. You know, we, we ever nobody gives a second thought to somebody wearing glasses. We really shouldn't be giving a second thought to somebody who needs oxygen therapy because it's more like a prosthesis than a device. It's not something that is is innately tied to being defective or anything like that. It's just they need a little bit more support. And we also need to build some more international coalitions and collaborations because we, as I've learned over the last couple of years, there are lessons from places as disparate as outback in Australia and, and sub-Saharan Africa, where we can learn lessons from those places and apply them here at home in our rural areas for disaster response for all kinds of areas. So we need to start building those networks and collaborations. So in summary, oxygen therapy has been broken through a series of misunderstandings, assumptions, and wrong decisions, frankly, some negligence on our part as clinicians and, and advocates. But each of these barriers really represents an opportunity for all of us as RTs to make an impact for people. We can do that education. We can do that reevaluation, make sure somebody is on the right piece of equipment and knows how to use it and has been tested properly. And we need to understand that oxygen therapy can help optimize all those outcomes. When we understand how to use the equipment and we understand how to teach people how to use that equipment, and when they understand the how and why they're on oxygen therapy, they're going to have a much higher quality of life. They're going to stay engaged with their family and their community, and it's just going to work out better for, for everybody involved. So I'll leave you with one final thought, kind of our catchphrase from World Oxygen Day, which we um, just celebrated our second annual one on October 2nd. Everybody needs oxygen. Some bodies need a little bit extra. So help us get it for them. Help us do that education. Help us help everybody breathe a little bit easier. With that, I thank you. Um, one more QR code for you on the screen right here. This is my contact information. You can also see my email address, mhess at copdfoundation.org. Happy to answer any questions, take any comments, um, work with anybody who, who is working to improve this space. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come out today. I look forward to uh, um, collaborating with anybody who's interested. And I hope you all uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, series. Uh, live here in a second. Hey, thank you, everyone. Um, I have Mike here. We are having some uh, video difficulties, but I do have him on the other line and uh, we'll go ahead and answer, have him uh, ask questions and we'll uh, get his answers to those. And uh, we'll be sharing that through um, the phone here. So Mike, first question, uh, why aren't more regulations on POC companies and, non, and the non-concentrators? Well, that's a really good question. And I think it largely has to do with the fact that um, oxygen therapy in general has been neglected for a couple of decades now. And also that FDA doesn't really understand a lot of the issues at play. You know, we, we've, we've brought this up to them. Um, uh, there was a group of us that brought it up to FDA uh, on a webinar. Uh, this was probably about a year and a half ago. And it was seemed to be completely new information for them. So, you know, these are, <clears throat> it's to a degree very similar to the supplement industry where, you know, even if they have a disclaimer buried somewhere in there, um, you know, they can get away with some of these things. Um, but I do think that it's an issue of bringing it to FDA and the Federal Trade Commission and the Product Safety Commission and all these other organizations, because obviously the regulation is needed. Um, and we just need to make sure that they understand that it's a priority. All right. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, next question that uh, we have from the audience is what practices do you think we can implement in office now to improve patient understanding and compliance with oxygen therapy? Well, the, the, the very first thing I would say is to do it. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who um, come to us at the foundation through our various channels and they say that no one ever told me why I need to use oxygen therapy. Um, you know, and then of course, with all the cuts in, in DME suppliers over the years, there are a lot of people who tell us that they still never get taught how to use their oxygen therapy. So any little bit counts. Um, you know, I know it's easy, easy for me to spend other people's time as I like to say, but, um, you know, any bit of education that you can do to uh, make sure that people are understanding the nuts and bolts of it, including the whys and wherefores, 
um, is extremely helpful. Um, so you know, that, that can look at a couple of a couple of different ways. Um, it can be video resources, it can be hands-on training, it can be all those sorts of things. Um, and that is something that also needs to be developed. So we're actively working with some of our industry partners through the COPD Foundation um, to try to get those resources available to make it easier to provide that education. But uh, unfortunately, that part is still a work in progress. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I think you're right on there. Education is key. All right. Next question. In a perfect world, how would you fix the oxygen problem as it stands today? Oh, boy. Well, the first thing I would do is uh, change the laws of physics so that we can uh, provide uh, <laughs> higher rates of flow for oxygen therapy. Right. Um, but um, uh, honestly, you know, the, the, the key would be to make sure people are getting the oxygen equipment that works well for them. For some people, that would be a return to liquid oxygen. For some people, that would be a portable concentrator. For some people, it might even be, um, you know, tanks. It, but we don't currently have a mechanism to really match the equipment delivery with the person's needs and values and goals and everything else. So that's really the ideal is to make sure people are educated as to the why, like I said, but also making sure that they've got equipment that matches uh, not only their why, but their how and, you know, how to make sure that we're keeping them active and everything else. You know, I actually just had this conversation earlier today here at the AERC Congress. We tell people as clinicians, the best thing you can do for your lung condition is to stay active and keep moving and stay engaged and all that. And then, oh, by the way, here's your boat anchor that prevents you from doing most of that. And that's got to change. Right. And I think that's where that portability is uh, such a, a, a key to that therapy. All right. Next question. Uh, what are some ways to get involved in changing healthcare, the healthcare regulations outside of contacting uh, the representatives in Congress? Um, well, you know, it, it's an ongoing process. I mean, it, ultimately, that, that's really where the rubber is going to meet the road. And we do need to have those legislative solutions. Um, but in the meantime, we can also be working to adapt, or I should say, kind of bypass some of the current regulations. And again, just making sure that we're providing that education, making sure that um, we're working, for example, let's say you're a discharge planner, um, work with your DME companies to provide some demo equipment so that you can you know, do the test. If you're doing testing in your hospital, um, you can test people on various kinds of equipment and see what's going to match them appropriately and then work with your DME supplier to get that equipment to the patients. Um, you know, it's little bits like that that can really demonstrate some value, uh, not only to the patient, but to the healthcare system, because you know, that's again going to help people be more adherent to their therapy and, and everything else. So uh, until we have that broad national legislation, uh, it's just gonna be some of the incremental stuff kind of chewing around the edges. Gotcha. All right, thanks for that, Mike. All right, next question that we have, I know we got a few more minutes here. Uh, for patients that don't tolerate a pulsed dose setting on a POC, but are really insistent on using that small portable therapy, um, what would you recommend for them so they don't just refuse a the therapy altogether? Well, it's tough because it kind of, sometimes it comes down to relative risk, right? Um, you know, you can uh, actually had somebody uh, tell me that, that they had this conversation with, uh, I believe, their brother um, who said, well, you know, do I have to do this? And um, this therapist said, no, you don't have to. You have a choice. You can use what you've got available and survive or you can um, not and probably not. Uh, now that's you know, a little harsh on its face. I would probably polish that up a little bit, but um, you know, it really comes down to, again, what are those individual goals? Um, is it your goal to stay healthy? Then you're probably gonna have to compromise something, um, whether it's, you know, again, the weight or the mobility or what have you. If you are, uh, for lack of a better word, content, with uh, low low saturations and you're you this is the only thing you're going to do and you understand the risks then i mean i guess you kind of have to meet people where they are gotcha all right uh, mike looks like we have uh, one more question um is it a regulation uh that education uh to the patient has to be done by a licensed health practitioner uh, and a driver is only allowed to deliver the equipment and not allowed to teach uh, to my knowledge, that is not a regulation, which 
you know, I suppose has some pros and cons. Um, you know, it's not really the driver's realm to provide that education. That's not to say that they can't provide some of it, at least, um, you know, beyond the basic safety elements to it. You know, because, again, we have to face some economic realities right now. Again, going back to that perfect world, yes, it would be a, a licensed or a subject matter expert in this area. Um, but to my right, to my knowledge, it's not a current regulation, um, which is something we're also hoping to address with the SOAR Act by getting that reimbursement element for RTs to go out and provide that uh, and to fill that role exactly that exactly thus. Gotcha. All right. Well, thank, thanks for that. And uh, unfortunately, it looks like we're out of time. So, Mike, I do appreciate you partaking in our JSM forum this year. Great presentation, a lot of great information. So thank you. And thank you for everyone who's uh, attending. Yes, thank you very much. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And if anybody does have some more questions that we weren't able to get to today, uh, please feel free to contact me. I believe you have my my information. Um, and I'm happy to uh, follow up how, and help however I can. Great. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it, Mike. All right. Th thank you again. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for spending your day with us. Today, we had the opportunity to learn from the best in the nation in sleep and respiratory care. We hope you learned at least one something new today. For those of you looking to earn your CEUs from today's event, your certificate of completion will be sent to your registered email address tomorrow, Friday, November 22nd. Your certificate will detail all CEUs earned through completion of the evaluations for the lectures you attended. Your feedback matters to us. Today's event is very important to our team and we want it to bring as much value as possible to you. Keep an eye out for our email survey in the coming days. We appreciate you taking a moment to share your thoughts to help us make this event the best it can be. In closing, a heartfelt thank you to our speakers, our sponsors, and our fellow DME partners. And a special note of appreciation to our MSC team members contributing to this event, especially our planning committee, led by Julie Banez and Katie Summer. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you, and see you next year.